Okay, this part of the lecture is about the diversity of fishes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this evolutionary tree uh, and I'm going to describe very quickly different parts of this evolutionary tree that represent the major different branches of fishes. Myxinoidea, Petrobizontoidea, Chondrichthys, Actinopterygii, and Actinistia. Fishes from an evolutionary perspective represent all of the things we normally call fishes, but also all of the things that are derived from fishes. So that's amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals, and us. Now about half of that total diversity of vertebrates represents the things that we colloquially call fish. That is, uh, the things that swim around in the ocean have fins, right? So you can see, looking at the diversity of all life, uh, vertebrate life, you can see that fishes represent about half of all of the species. So we're going to talk about that just in this next 20 minutes. And then in the other lectures, we're going to go through those other groups that you see on the right hand side there. Okay, so let's take into this evolutionary tree and look at each of the different groups. Now, first, we're going to look at uh, these two groups here called Myxinoidea, the hagfishes, and Petromyzontoidea, the lampreys. If you remember, in the introductory material for my cabin, I showed you a lamprey. And these guys have a particular characteristic which is not shared with the rest of the vertebrates. In particular, they are vertebrates, but they do not have jaws. So they're not yet nathostomes. Nathostomes means jawed mouth. Lampreys and hagfishes do not have that. So they have no jaws. Their skeleton is cartilaginous, not uh, made of bone. Now they do have that notochord that is shared by all the chordates, of course, but they're retaining it in the adult form. Uh, and they also have the gill slits, of course, because they are um, uh, chordates, which all have the pharyngeal gill slits. They do not have paired fins. Paired fins is going to be a feature that evolves later on in the evolutionary tree on a different branch. Uh, and they do not have a swim bladder, which is something I'll talk about that is used for buoyancy in a lot of fishes. Uh, and they do not have scales, which of course is something that we often commonly associate with fish. Okay, so let's talk about these things. Hagfish are super, super cool critters. Um, they have a number of really cool features. They tend to be scavengers on the bottom of the ocean, but I just think it's so cool to talk about the really bizarre things that hagfishes do. Uh, in particular, since they don't have a jaw, they can't chew things and move it about, which means that it's difficult for them to tear flesh off of something that they might be scavenging. So they, they don't have anything to pull against because they don't have a jaw, they don't have um, arms, so they can't grab something and push against it. So instead what they do is they create their own thing to push against, that is they actually tie a knot in their body and then that knot moves down the body until the head can pull through the knot and therefore they have some leverage to pull something off of what they're foraging on. Oh yeah, and then there's the crazy slime that they can produce, which I forgot all about, where they can just produce massive amounts of slime uh, in a very short amount of time, which is a defense against predators. And there's a lot of cool videos showing how fish bite them, their mouths fill with slime, and then basically they let them go. Another bizarre thing is that um, fishes do a lot of regulation of their uh, salts in their bodies in relation to the water outside of them, but hagfishes do not. The osmotic concentration of their body is the same as that in the water. You can buy eel skin wallets. Um, when I was a kid, my mother bought me one of these wallets and it's made from hagfish, not from eels. The other group of jawless fishes, they're also called agnathans, which means without jaw, is the lampreys. Now they also don't have a jaw, but they have an oral disc that has these rasping structures on the inside. And the key thing that I mentioned in the introductory uh, material from my cabin was that they have a distinct larval form that's called an amocete. And it's uh, filter feeding, it lives in fresh water, but then some of the lampreys then migrate from fresh water out into the ocean where they become parasitic on other fishes. And on the lower right, you see a lamprey on a lake trout. And that is a representation of the importance of lampreys when they invaded the Great Lakes following the construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway. They had a massive effect on reducing populations of lake trout and other fishes in the Great Lakes. And so now millions of dollars are spent every year trying to control lamprey populations. Now we're going to go into the nathostomata, and so everything after that has the evolution of jaws. 
So you can see that uh, earlier we talked about uh, in chordates, you had the dorsal hollow nerve cord, the notochord, and the muscular postanal tail. And then when you went into the branch that became vertebrates, you have the evolution of the vertebrae and the cranium. Uh, and that's in myxonoidia and petromyzontoidia. So everything after this within vertebrates is a nathostome, that is you have jaws. Jaws, of course, were not present in these early fishes and present day agnathans, that is pet, uh, lampreys and hagfishes. And they're formed by the fusion of the gill arches. So here the gill arches come back again, these pharyngeal gill slits that all vertebrates have, at least ancestrally. So in this case, the gill arches uh, that were present ancestrally in jawless vertebrates, you have the fusion and the development and expansion of some of those uh, to form the jaws. So our jaws are the remnants of arches that were supporting the pharyngeal gill slits of our evolutionary ancestors. Now, of course, jaws ancestrally have gotten very big. This is a megalodon jaw. Megalodon sharks were huge, so much so that, of course, it inspired a whole series of popular movies, including um, Shark Attack 3, Megalodon, The Terror Has Surfaced. This is way bigger than megalodons actually ever got. So all the jawed fishes also have paired fins. And so these include the pectoral girdles, so pectoral fins, which are our arms and our shoulders, and the uh, pelvic girdle, which is our hips and our legs. When you have these paired fins are much more effective for uh, active swimming, but they're also used for steering, that is manipulating, stabilizing your body as you're moving through the water, and for generating lift so you don't sink. So sharks, for instance, swim not continuously, but they swim a lot because they don't have a swim bladder to hold themselves up like a buoyancy, but they can use their fins and they can angle them such that when they swim forward, it will keep them at the desired plane in the water, like an airplane. Okay, so now in this group of nathosomes with jaws now and paired fins, let's start by talking about the chondrichthys, that is the cartilaginous fishes, sharks, rays, and skates. They're mostly marine, although you see some in fresh water. They have these paired fins, they have jaws, uh, they have five to seven gill slits, uh, gill slit pairs, and they also have scales now, which is something that the agnathans also did not have. They do not, however, have the swim bladder, which will evolve on the bony fish's line, not the cartilaginous fish's line. You can go diving with manta rays in many places in the world. They put lights down on the bottom at night, which then attracts uh, zooplankton, which then the manta rays come, and essentially they can do like somersaults um, in just in these little plumes of light, which represent this collection of zooplankton. And so you can dive with them. And so this is a picture I took in Hawaii uh, many years ago and the head that you can sort of barely see in the bottom of that image is the head of my uh, girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife. So those are skates and rays. They're sort of compressed like this, so that their fins are on the side and they're very flat. Uh, you also have the classic sharks, including the smallest living shark ever, which is called the dwarf lantern shark. It's only 16 centimeters long. And the largest living shark ever, which is the whale shark, which can be up to 18 meters long. Again, if I was lecturing in the auditorium at McGill, I would bring a big measuring tape and we'd spread it out through the entire auditorium so you could see that a whale shark would barely fit in the auditorium that is built for 500 students. So if you remember I said that pharyngeal gill slits were originally used for filter feeding and things like urochordates and cephalochordates before they were co-opted for respiration and gas exchange. And here you see that this filter feeding apparatus for the gills is still retained in many fishes including whale sharks and basking sharks, and here you can see basking sharks that are um, filter feeding. Also, of course, uh, sharks, that is chondrichthys, include sort of the classic shark that you might think of, which would be the great white shark. And there are these really cool videos of sharks coming down from quite deep 
then going very rapidly toward the surface to grab marine mammals on the surface, and then moving so quickly that they shoot right out of the water. My favorite shark, which I'd love to go whole, give a whole lecture on, is the cookie cutter shark. Now the cookie cutter shark has this really bizarre jaw structure, which looks like that, like a, like a Halloween costume. Now what they do with this is that they basically use it to sort of grab onto something really quickly and turn in a circle and create little circular like bites out of the side of a fish or marine mammal or anything. And so here you see a cookie cutter shark on the lower right, you see cookie cutter shark scars on a tuna on the lower left, uh, on a shark on the upper left, and on the acrylic dome of a submarine. So you can imagine being in a submarine really uh, low in the water and having this cookie cutter shark rasping a hole in the dome of your submarine while you're underwater. So they'll grab onto all kinds of things. Now I'd heard about cookie cutter sharks and I thought they were really cool, but I never thought I would ever sort of have an interaction with their effects until I went to Año Nuevo, a park where you have lots of elephant seals in California. And I spotted this seal here. I said, what are all those marks on that seal? Those little circular marks. And the, the guide there said, well, those are cookie cutter shark bites. And I was like, what? What, what did this seal just sit and let like a cookie cutter shark take bite after bite after bite after bite out of it? So I looked it up and it turns out that what they do is they have a color and shape that mimics that of other fish. And so they are present as a school of fish down in the water. Uh, something will swim down to try and attack them and they will all turn on it instantly and try to bite it. Crazy stuff. So those bites may have occurred almost instantaneously when that elephant seal tried to attack those sharks. How's that for a nightmare? This is actually one of my uh, most retweeted tweets. Okay, so we've got a few more fish groups to do. Now we've been talking about chondrichthys, cartilaginous fishes, where their skeleton is mostly made of cartilage, but now we're going to move on to the bony fishes. We, of course, are bony fishes from an evolutionary perspective. Okay, so in this second part of nathostomes, in these osteichthys, bony fishes, these have by far the highest diversity, uh, and they still, of course, have jaws. They have an operculum, that is a bony plate that's protecting their gills. They have the paired fins, of course, and scales, all of which evolved in the joint ancestor to both cartilaginous and bony fishes. And now they also have a swim bladder. Now the swim bladder is like the um, buoyancy control device in a scuba system. That is, you fill it with air, and as you go down, as the air compresses, you put air in to expand the air, and therefore you can maintain your buoyancy. And then as you go up, the air is expanding, and so you let it out so that you don't shoot and rock it up into the surface. Now in fishes, uh, this flotation device, which can enable neutral buoyancy as you move up and down the water column, uh, can be done in two different ways and one is by gulping air and forcing it from your digestive system into the swim bladder but the other way is through a specialized gas gland that changes the chemical properties of the blood and therefore enables um, oxygen to go from the blood through a counter current system into the gas bladder. There are two major groups of uh, bony fishes. And these include the actinopterygians, the raid finned fishes, but you also have the lobe finned fishes, the sarcopterygians, these are the lung fishes and coelacanths, which are personally important because they represent the branch of fishes from which the rest of the vertebrates involved, including us. Coelacanths are really cool because they were thought to be extinct for many, many millions of years, 50 million years. And they were only discovered in the 1930s uh, and then subsequently described uh, based on this really cool story of a woman at a very uh, small museum in the coast of South Africa who found this uh, coelacanth sticking out from underneath a pile of other fishes. And then she uh, contacted, a, she tried to preserve the thing and she contacted a famous ichthyologist and they then worked together for another 15 to 20 years before they could find another specimen and describe the coelacanth. So there's a series of really cool books written about this. I highly recommend this one, A Fish Caught in Time. I really enjoyed reading it and it's about this wonderful story of intrigue and debate and controversy associated with the discovery of this fish that had thought to have been extinct for 50 million years. 
Now, one of the branches within the Actinopterygians is the Teleos fishes, and this is where you see a massive diversification of all different kinds of fishes. I don't have time to tell you about them all, so let me just simply give you a couple of cool examples of the diversity of teleosts. Uh, these include, for instance, the deep sea angler fishes, uh, which can be very deep, and they have these bioluminescent lures. Uh, and also, they're really cool, for instance, they have parasitic males, so they're so deep and so widely spread that males and females almost never contact each other, and so they've evolved a system where if a male contacts a female, at any time it will grab onto that female and never let go. As a matter of fact, their blood system fuses with that of the female, and the male just becomes a little bag of sperm, waiting for when the female is going to reproduce, she'll have sperm uh, that she just carries with her in the form of a male that's permanently attached to her side. Of course, other things I talked about in the introductory lecture, such as northern pike, um, whitefish, salmon, and stickleback are all teleos as well. Many other cool teleos, like for instance mud skippers, so that they get out of the water, they spend most of their time out of the water, flopping around uh, uh, out on land and displaying to each other, and only really get, keeping themselves wet by going in the water and moist and uh, rearing, rearing their eggs underwater. We also have these uh, angler fishes in the lower left where they go below the water and they squirt water out to knock insects out of branches and into the water so that they can then grab them. Uh, the world's smallest vertebrate, some argue to be, which is shown in that uh, little vial there. There's angler fishes on the, in the bottom with the, um, with the parasitic male on the top in this case. You have the four-eyed fish, which has separate retinas, one half of it for seeing outside of the water and one half of it for seeing inside the water. And you also have the flat fishes, such as halibut, where you start development in a larval form on the upper right there with the two eyes on either side of the head like a normal fish, but then during development, one eye moves on to the side of the head here, and then they lie down and spend the rest of their life essentially lying on one side on the bottom of the ocean, with one eye having developmentally migrated up to join the other eye on the top of the head. And on the bottom right, you have the red-lipped batfish from Galapagos, which sort of walks around on its pectoral and pelvic fins. Okay, so that's it for the fish lecture. And uh, in there, we describe some of the diversity of fish, but also talked about some of these particular innovations that ultimately make fish better, stronger, faster.